Hello, this is Kevin Ray Evans. I and my colleague Robert Pavlovsky are at the Missouri State University in the Department of Geography, Geology, and Planning. The title of my talk is Ray Shore Platforms and an Early Jamaican Potsherd in Southwestern St. Elizabeth Parish, Jamaica. Neotectonic Implications for an Archaeological Hypothesis. I'd like to thank the Department of Geography, Geology, and Planning, College of Natural Applied Sciences, and Missouri State University for support for this research effort and for the ability to go down on a series of study way trips to Jamaica as well. My interest in this project was to look at carbonates in the southwestern coast of Jamaica. Many of the carbonates have been described before in places in the north and in the southeastern part of the island. And uh, in the west, been uh, a series of, of studies as well. But uh, there are a few tidbits here and there that I thought were relatively interesting. And so this is to give you a little bit of an explanation about what's going on for the Holocene uh, in that part of the world. Uh, Rayshore platforms that are in Jamaica, they're about one of these ones in, uh, in St. Elizabeth Parish anyway, are about one meter above sea level and they've been encrusted by circulate worms. Now, we recently have had a couple of age dates on those, and it places the the age of those worm tubes at about 1,000 years before present. And uh, so with those dates, uh, what also we have found is there was a red wear potsherd cemented to the seafloor just in front of one of these rayshore platforms. So if the age of the circulate worms, which live and grow in marine waters uh, gives any indication for any sort of tectonic event and there is a wave cut notch below these sort of features so the, the raised shore platform was there first it was encrusted and then it is now above sea level by one meter something that may have happened here and we think it probably was some sort of seismic event uh, it could have also triggered a tsunami Redware was the earliest cultural influence in Jamaica that um, are found across much of the, uh, the greater Antilles. And they gave rise, in fact, to the Miacon Osteonoid culture. And that was roughly around 900 AD, you know, some other uh, sites so give that uh, age date. So in the past, people have suggested that climate change and hurricanes may have been the, an influence in that transition. We'd like to pose a, uh, an alternative hypothesis that, in fact, maybe the seismic event or a possible tsunami could have caused that transit as well. Uh, shore platforms are pretty easy to describe. They're erosional features along rocky coastlines where you get a beveling of the uh, surface. And we get the same thing in Jamaica. If we look at that surface in detail, it appears that it has been removed by erosion first and then was uplifted later after it was encrusted. That surface is kind of a reactivated unconformity uh, in the coastal group itself. And so there are, um, in the coastal group, ranges from mid-Miocene to, to Pleistocene. And, um, and so that there is an unconformity below what's known as the Falmouth Formation in this area. The Falmouth Formation is mostly a coral root stone. And as a coral root stone, it was deposited during the last interglacial. So there was an unconformity as sea level rose. The uh, MIS 5E, we have some age dates on the Falmouth in this area as well. A student I work with uh, was able to get some electron spin resonance age dates on that. And then um, the that rock unit was deposited and then sea level fell, of course. And so as sea level fell during the last glacial maximum, it was several tens of meters uh, below the present surface now. Uh, so where sea level is at today, about a thousand years ago, there must have been some sort of event that raised the shore platform. And so these biological incarnations are pretty interesting as well. Could they have been a result of sea level fall? That's that's always a, a good alternative hypothesis, but we have no indication that they were. There's no indication anywhere else along the coastline of the Caribbean islands that there was a major change of sea level about a thousand years ago. This is the location for Treasure Beach in St. Elizabeth Parish. So you can see it's in the southwestern corner of Jamaica. Uh, Jamaica is a very tectonically active island. Uh, there are a whole series of faults that pass through the island, and and most of the activity in today is in the Blue Mountains in the east, uh, but there was also some tectonic activity in the west as well. So uh, Benford and all uh, and others in 2014 published on a geologic uh, structural map for uh, and, and tectonic map for uh, for southwestern Jamaica. And they recognize a whole series of restraining bends that may have occurred all the way across the island 
uh, in some of these terrains that look like they were, they look like tilt block terrains and, uh, but they're probably, you know, activated by the fault movements along here. So, so in the geologic map of this area, there are some hills and some valleys that are associated with faults. And some of the major faults would include the West Coast or South Coast Fault uh, Zone, which runs pretty much all the way from the Enrique, Enriqueo Plantain Garden Fault in the east, all along the south coast of Jamaica. So uh, where the platforms themselves occur, that's mostly in uh, the area around Fort Charles. It's the name of the community there, uh, a little bit north of Treasure Beach. So, But there are race shore platforms all along this area. And, uh, but, but only a handful of them have been encrusted. And so those are the ones that are mainly focusing. So the stratigraphy along this coastline, the coastal group here you see is the Pleistocene part of that. And this would be associated with the MIS 5E interval. And, uh, this one actually, you can see that unconformity at the base of this, where there's been deposition of a coral root stone. They've had to concrete around the uh, bottom of this, uh, cliff here because there's a house up at the top of the cliff. And uh, it is, in fact, rapidly eroding even today. So these blocks will like wind up on the on the beach, I'm sure. The age date for the MIS 5E was about 125 to about 80,000 years ago. And the deposition along here was mostly corals and fine sand. At the very top, there's uh, some cross-bedded sandstones that indicate uh, sea level fall. The white limestone group is below that. There are some other rocks that may be below this as well that belong to MIS-8 or MIS-9 time intervals, but those are older than the MIS-5E. On to the next uh, slide here. It shows you what it looks like at Black Spring Point. You can see the unconformity here. And you can see a wave, a uh, shortcut platform, a shore platform here uh, in, in between the two caves here. And so there is actually a freshwater spring that runs out uh, in one of the caves on the left-hand side there. And uh, there's a sinkhole up on top inside of these. So those two caves, in fact, join up at that sinkhole. So that raised shore platform here is not encrusted in this location, but they begin right there and off to the right, to the south and east. They crop out more extensively. So uh, in the next slide, you'll actually see here these platforms away from uh, another outcrop of the coastal group uh, limestone there. And so these blocks themselves, these are Holocene in age, of course, that, that uh, unconformity is essentially flat and then encrusted by the serpulid worms and then ray. So very tectonic. Uh, next slide shows you some of the blocks that have toppled onto this surface. And so the blocks are actually on top in places of these encrusted ray shore platforms. And so they're relatively recent, some of them. Uh, but some of them may, in fact, be fairly old as well. So um, anyway, we're going to look at that in more detail in the future. Uh, but, uh, but here you can see some of the incrustation. You see this sort of relatively flat surface here that looks as though it, well, appearances, it almost looks as though it's had wax dripped over the top of it. And that's the sort of uh, technique that um, circulated worms would just encrust anything, a carbonate that allows them to have a substrate in order to form essentially what are reefs here. So if you go on to the next slide here, we are looking at raised shore platforms again. And these things are being rapidly undercut at sea level today, just a meter above sea level, and then below them, taffony and, uh, and really erosion of that. Um, at Harvey's Bay, that's one of the small bays in between Black Spring Point and Fort Charles. Uh, you can see here a picture of that house uh, up on the, on the top surface up here. Um, and that is the cliff down below here, uh, right near the pool here. But you can see the ray shore platforms along the coastline here, and some of them are submerged in uh, below sea level. Uh, so this is drone imagery that was taken by uh, Toby Dogweiler at Missouri State. So in the next slide, you can actually see a cartoon uh, version of what we think the geology is like in this area. Now, there may be some problems with identifying the white limestone group at the bottom here. That may also be the 8 or S9. So there are other rockies that crop out along here, and I'd like to thank Simon Mitchell, actually, who's uh, made some constructive comments on this presentation. Um, so, and, and Simon Mitchell is at uh, University of the West Indies at Mona, Mona campus. And he's been a real help uh, in trying to get started and looking at some of the geology area. So uh, in places, the surface that was encrusted is actually beveled lower part of the MIS-5E. In other places, it's the lower unconformity surface. But you see here, 
the incrustation relatively thin across. Uh, where I've been able to measure it, it's only five or six centimeters in thickness. And uh, on to the next slide, you can actually see what these look like up close. And so the uh, serpulid worms are kind of uh, anastomosing assemblages of, of uh, aragonitic uh, tubes. They're essentially tube worms, and, and dwelling among them are some of these vermited uh, uh, gastropods, these sort of like uh, benthic sessile gastropods, which would feed off of, of nutrient-rich waters uh, once they were submerged. And so that's what the serpulid worms look like. Uh, serpulids belong to the polychaetes. They're a form of sabellid worm. Uh, they belong to the family Serpulidae. Uh, there's 490 living species, and they range everywhere from just at sea level uh, all the way down to over 600 meters in depth. And so they're all around the world. Uh, they find them in cold water. They find them in, in uh, tropical water here as well. Uh, they're also known as fan worms or feather worms, I guess. Um, so with they can be considered to be modern reef formers as well. There have been uh, serpulid reefs that have been described from places like Gulf of Mexico coast in Texas. Uh, sabellid worms are related to these, of course, and so sabellid worms are more agglutinated sort of skeletons that, that those worms would make, but both of them form tubes, essentially. So on to the next slide here. Here's a vermited, uh, also ran with this uh, group of fauna who were on these uh, encrusted platforms. The next slide shows you the camid uh, jewel box bivalve, which was also a benthic sessel organism that would have uh, lived in this sort of setting. These encrusted like this were essentially like reefs. So we took some samples of this material and took it back to the States, uh, sent it off to uh, Beta Analytic for some age dates. And we have a couple of age dates now, one from Mahoy de, uh, Bay, uh, it came back uh, 1530 plus or minus 30 before present. And, but in a calibrated uh, age date, it would be 1184 to 940. And that's with a confidence interval of 94. So roughly that is 888 plus or minus 122 AD. And these things haven't been set according to the, the Delta 13C or the Delta 18. They fall within the normal sort of range of uh, cements and uh, or a skeletal material this time period. So... The, uh, the the latest age date we have was an AMS age date, and that came in at 1190 plus or minus 30, which is pretty tight. And But its calibrated age date was 1296 plus or minus C2. So there's a couple of different age dates, and they don't over. So that's one of the issues that we're going to deal with. We're going to get try to get some more carbon-14 age dates off of material. Um, and just to reiterate an argument, the Holocene sea level has risen dramatically over the last 8,000 years. But there's no indication of a sea level fall. So why are these platforms one meter above sea level? It's a, a more parsimonious explanation to suggest that these things were actually raised tectonically as opposed to having a sea level fall make that change of sea level. So what are the major faults around here? Um, the Pondside Fault is the one that kind of brackets the southwestern coastline. And it runs along Fort Charles. And uh, in fact, it runs all the way from Black River uh, south and along a, uh, an area called the Ponce. It's the uh, Wally Wash Pond. And the Pond Side Fault kind of is on the eastern side of the pond. So that's the, the location of it. Well, one more photograph to show you some more of these raised platforms. But in this case, ones that were not uh, encrusted with serpulid worms, at least the one in the upper left is not. That's actually within the MIS-5E. And the MIS-5E was beveled at some point along here. Uh, but on the lower right and the upper right and on the lower left, those are all the remnants of the encrusted shore platforms. And in fact, the one on the lower right here is the platform in which we found the potware, the uh, redware pot shirt. And so on to the next slide here, it shows you the location exactly here. That's the same uh, swimming pool and house that you see uh, at the top of the photo on the left hand side. There's the potsherd directly on, uh, cemented to the sea floor here. You can see it in the middle two photographs here, a close up and then a farther away. Um, and then here's a little tiny piece of that potsherd. Now that resides now at a museum uh, turtle facility. And you can see that actually on the left hand side here. That's that octagonal building or the hexagonal building at the very bottom of the image here. So this is all an area where there's turtle sanctuary uh, for nesting hawksbill turtles. And uh, it's very important to them to know the, the natural heritage, the natural history of this uh, area. And so we've returned that uh, pottery shirt. We pried it off to get a, uh, 
an identification of that. And actually it was uh, Zachary Beyer from uh, UE Mona, who also has been very helpful with and helped identify uh, provisionally that pottery. So on the next slide, you can actually see the two cultures that are uh, put on a timeline here, starting at about 600 AD. That's when the first peoples arrived in Jamaica. And, uh, and contact was close to 1500 AD, 1490 for Jamaica. And the two age dates that we have are bracketed, uh, bracket that area through the Osteonoid, Osteonian, uh, Osteonoid series at the bottom. And then the second age date that we have that's 1296 plus or minus 62 AD, uh, is actually within the Mayakon, uh, Osteonoid series here. Uh, there may have been some events that occurred at that time as well. So we're not sure which one it is more accurate. Uh, but we would like to get more age dates to see uh, around which sort of dates that they would cluster. So um, so the redware sites that are known in Jamaica, there are not a lot of them, but most of them are on that southwestern corner of the island. There's a handful in the north as well. Uh, so um, they're always on or near a sandy beach. They, had, they tend to have very thin middens, only 10 centimeters or so. And it was actually Lee, who was a geologist as well, but one of the early archaeologists from the island, who had demonstrated that these things actually have kind of a wide halo of distribution. So they're not really nicely compacted sort of middens that you find uh, with this culture. And they're always close, of course, to uh, fresh water as well. So uh, hurricanes, is that a good explanation for this? Well, others have argued, Donnelly in 2015, they have indicated that the Western North Atlantic appears to have been active between 250 and 1150 CE, well, with high levels of activity persisting in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico until 1400 uh, CE. If there's one thing that Jamaicans uh, really know how to cope with, it's hurricanes. And so, um, you know, it could certainly impact their uh, their lifestyle and it could impact where they lived. But other, other explanations would uh, potentially could both explain the halo-like distribution of materials or is there... Uh, another one that could be uh, potentially well, earth shattering, if you will. And I will um, point out there was the 1692 uh, Port Royal in the 1907 Kingston earthquakes uh, back in, you know, early in, in post contact at times, post, if you will. Uh, so what kind of earthquake would you estimate from the three, three kilometer distance that we find these rayshore platforms and having one meter of rupture surface? It could be as large as a 6.5 event. So uh, is it a testable hypothesis? Well, I think that it is. It is, it, is it difficult to, to di differentiate storm deposits from tsunamiites? Sure it is. Um, is it even possible to detect paleo, paleo seismicity? I'm not so sure about that in this situation. Uh, mostly what people look for are large blocks that have been overturned and displaced. So are these topple blocks, could they have been related to that uh, uh, seismic event as well 1,000 years ago? Well, there are areas that the blocks are on top of that... Uh, in crustaceans, but there's actually been a a slight indention made around these uh, surfaces where they may actually uh, predate the uplift of this coastline as well. So it's not an easy issue to get at. And right here in the next slide, and next and last slide, I'll point out that this is uh, my colleague, Robert Pavlovsky. I want to thank him for inviting me and taking so many generations of students down to Jamaica. We've had a wonderful time when we visit down there, but the problems aren't completely solved yet, and we hope that we can work on them some more. Anyway, if you have some questions, I'd be willing and happy to try to help answer those. So uh, during the interactive session. Um, thanks a lot. We'll talk to you soon. Bye now.